Hello, my name is Morgan, and I found something out about myself as a reader very recently, and that is that I love translated fiction. Now, my favorite book of all time is, and always has been, The NeverEnding Story by Michael End, which is translated from German, but I never made a conscious effort to read translated fiction specifically until this month, because August is Women in Translation Month, which is organized by the Women in Translation Movement, which was founded back in 20. 2013 to encourage more people to read translated fiction by women, because only about 30% of the fiction and poetry translated into English in the United States is by women. Of course, there's the obvious benefits to reading translated fiction, which is that you get to learn about other parts of the world, you get to travel without actually going anywhere, you get to maybe learn about international history and culture by reading about it in these fictional books, so it's also entertaining. But what I've gotten out of reading translated fiction the most is actually exposure to different types of storytelling. I found this particularly interesting as somebody who is a writer of nonfiction and an aspiring writer of fiction, because as I've said on this channel before, to be a good writer, you really need to read widely. And this includes reading from different cultural and geographic perspectives. What I didn't really realize until I started reading from a wide variety of languages though, is that each culture has its own genres and its own tropes and its own writing conventions and styles and ways that people are taught to write and what is considered good writing. So even if you're reading a fantasy novel that may not tell you anything about the history or contemporary culture of a place, the writing style is still going to give you insight into some of the cultural conventions. As I said, August is Women in Translation Month, and since it is August for me making this video, I have read exclusively books Books by women that have been translated into English from another language. And in this video today, I have 10 book recommendations for you, each one coming from a different language and a different place in the world. I have had by far the best reading month of my life this month, and I plan on continuing to seek out books written by women in other languages because some of my favorite books of all time are on this list, I have found, this month. At the beginning of the month, when I knew I was going to be making this video, I decided that one language that had to be on this list that I've actually never read from before was French and specifically French Canadian. Because in Canada, our biggest literary awards would be the Governor General's Literary Awards. And the Governor General's Literary Awards have an award for translated fiction from French to English and from English to French. So I started scrolling through the list of translated fiction from French to English, and I happened upon one that was shortlisted in 2013, and it's by Jocelyn Saucier and translated by Rhonda Mullins. That book is And the Birds Rain down. Jocelyn and Rhonda both reside in Quebec, and this book was turned into a film in 2019, which I plan on watching. This book was an absolute delight to read. It is set in Northern Ontario, and it follows the lives of two elderly gentlemen named Tom and Charlie, who have completely cut off all ties to the world outside of the Northern Ontario forest. Each of them have built a cabin up north where they spend all of their time, and almost nobody knows that they're there. They have a number of mechanisms that make sure nobody finds them, including a friend at a nearby hotel who will give people the wrong directions to get to them if anybody asks, because they really just want to be left alone to live out their lives with their loyal dogs. But one day, one woman is relentless. She decides she must find these men at any cost because she is a photographer and it is her current mission to take photos of every survivor of the Great Fires, which had taken place nearly a century earlier. And she got word that one of the survivors was living in the forest with Tom and Charlie. Unfortunately, she doesn't find him there, but she is charmed by Tom and Charlie and she becomes a, a regular installation in their lives. This book is only like 150 pages long, so if you need some relaxing summer reading, I highly recommend this book. This is sort of escapism at its finest because you are escaping into the Northern Ontario forest with a couple escapees from society. Next, I want to take us south of me to Argentina with a Spanish translation. This is Tender as the Flesh by Agustina Basterica and translated by Sarah Moses. Interestingly, Sarah Moses is actually Canadian. She's originally from Toronto. Tender as the Flesh is another pretty short read that I read from my library and it tells the story 
story of a dystopian future in which all of the animals have developed a disease that is poisonous to humans, and so animals can't be eaten anymore. That means that humans are forced to become vegans or eat each other. So cannibalism has been institutionalized and industrialized and normalized in this society. However, the way that they morally deal with this is by calling the humans that they eat special meat and calling the humans themselves heads. So this book is really about how we use language to sort of like sanitize and feel okay about our problematic behavior. The plot of the story follows a man who works at like a meat packaging plant. He is a middleman between the people preparing the heads and the people who are going to be purchasing them, like the butchers. And this all gets morally confusing for him when he is gifted a female head of his own who he can raise or butcher himself. The ending of this text is quite shocking. As you can imagine, there's a lot of content warnings for this one, so look into those. Bastor Rico was originally inspired to write this text by her brother, actually, who is a conscious food researcher and a chef. He inspired her to stop eating meat, and after she stopped eating meat, she started imagining that meat differently. She started wondering why this flesh on a plate isn't or couldn't be human flesh, because we too are edible animals. That said, just because Baz Tarika's inspiration was becoming a vegetarian herself and becoming repulsed by meat, this book is not just trying to convince you that you shouldn't eat meat, although it very much might do that. Baz Tarika said in an article, which I will link below, I have always believed that in our capitalist consumerist society, we devour each other. And we do that by objectifying and depersonalizing other humans, which this book demonstrates to great effect. High recommendation. Next is a book translated from the Dutch, and this is probably the most place-based and educational cultural book on this list because this book is Shocked Earth by Saskia Goldschmidt and translated by Antoinette Fawcett. Goldschmidt was originally born and raised in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, but she now lives north of Groningen in the Netherlands, where there are earthquakes happening and have been happening for decades now because of gas extraction. And this book tells the fictional story of one farm that has been affected by the very real gas extraction. So this is the story of a woman named Trine, her father Zweer, and her daughter Femke. The three of them live on a farm that has been in their family for generations. Femke is the real farmer of the family. She really wants to bring the farm into the contemporary age and go organic. But the extreme earthquakes caused by the gas extraction are hindering her ability to do so and destroying their buildings. Plus, her mother Trine is very resistant to this plan and very set in her ways and resistant to change in general. As I said, this book is based on true events. In the 60s, a giant gas field was found in Groningen and companies were eager to start extracting it. A small few warned them that this would cause major problems for the land, but those people were dismissed. And even when the ground started to shake because of this gas extraction, people were still told that there was absolutely no relationship between the earthquakes and the gas extraction. It wasn't until 2012 when a huge quake happened that the government and the gas companies started acknowledging maybe they had something to do with this. So Goldschmidt is clearly very passionate about this issue and actually went to live in the area to learn about it before writing this book. She said that she needed to be rooted in the natural habitat of the place, walking in the clay and cold winds, and experiencing a full year in the habitat before writing about it. The description of the land and of the wildlife on the land in this book is phenomenal, and the plot is gripping. I cared for all of the characters and wanted to see them succeed, and the political and social questions about change and climate that it raises were so interesting and thought-provoking, and I highly recommend this book. Definitely a new favorite. The next book I want to talk about was translated from the Danish. It is written by Olga Raven and translated by Martin Aitken. It is also one of my new favorite books of all time, and that book is The Employees. This book is set on a spaceship, and it tells the story of the employees of that ship. There are human employees, and there are humanoid employees, and the book itself is made up of statements by the employees to, I guess, the administration who are doing some investigating into a recent occurrence on the ship. And that occurrence is that there are 
objects being brought onto the ship of kind of like unknown ontology, I guess. Like they give off a scent, they give off particular feelings. Some of the people on the ship want to just spend all of their time with the objects. They're making the people reminisce and get nostalgic about home. They're making the humanoids on the ship question what it might be like to be human. Or at least all of these things are happening around the same time that people are getting more and more fascinated with these objects. The original inspiration to write this book actually came from a Copenhagen art exhibit. A sculptor actually reached out to Olga Ravin and asked if she would write a little something for the program for her sculpture exhibit. Olga Raven was so inspired that she wrote an entire book. In an article that I will link below, the artist that inspired this work said that she was interested in making forms that were not really human, but still living. And Raven was inspired by not only that, but also by NASA choosing new astronauts around this time, the idea of writing a book where the main character isn't an individual, but a group of people. She was inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin's work and inspired by how to make readers identify with the non-human. And all of those inspirations coalesced to create a sci-fi that experiments heavily with form and that is one of my new favorite books of all time. This next book is a translation from Polish and of course I had to include Olga Tokarczuk on this list. So the next book I want to tell you about is Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk and translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. Tokarczuk, if you don't know, is a Nobel Prize winning author and this book was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize in 2019. This is the only Tokarczuk that I've read, but I desperately want to read more because it was so good. I even have a video about it on my channel. Basically, this book features an elderly woman named Janina who lives in a rural Polish village located near the Czech border. Her neighbor, Bigfoot, is mysteriously found dead in his house and Janina is convinced that she knows who's doing it. She swears it is the animals getting back at the hunters in an act of vengeance. Unfortunately, being an old lady that lives in the forest, the police pay her no mind, even as the killings get more extreme and Janina's theory gets more and more undeniable. This is a great book that I continue to think about to this day. The next book is translated from Ukrainian. It actually was originally published back in 1996, and it was considered the most influential Ukrainian book for the 15 years of independence. This is Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex by Oksana Zabushko and translated by Helena Hren. Zabushko is a poet, and that is definitely clear in this text. It reads as a kind of extended stream of consciousness internal monologue with reflections on nationhood, gender, and sexuality. It flips flops between the first and second and third person, so it's quite hard to follow. There's very little discernible plot, but the main character is a Ukrainian woman who is a visiting professor of Slavic studies at Harvard, and some of the book is actually written in the style of an academic lecture. And this is why it really worked for me as an audiobook. If I had to describe this book in just a few words, I would say I wouldn't be surprised if it ended up on a third year gender study seminar curriculum. So if that doesn't sound appealing to you, you might not enjoy this book. However, because I was listening to it as an audiobook and not for like a class. I didn't get too caught up in the meaning of the piece. I kind of just let the prose wash over me. This book has been adapted into a solo show and I can totally understand why it might work in that format because the whole time I was listening to it, I was actually thinking of Samuel Beckett's play, Not I, which is also a kind of stream of consciousness internal monologue that uses the third person, plus a lot of repetition. But I definitely don't think this book is for everyone. So give it a go if that sounds interesting. This next book though is probably my favorite book of all time next to the never ending story. It's actually also coming out of Ukraine, but it's originally written in Russian. And that is Vida Nostra by Marina and Sergei Dyachenko. Sergei actually just passed away this year. This book was translated by Julia Hersey. I love this book. I will definitely reread this book. I have an entire video dedicated to this book, so I will link to that. But in general, it's about this girl who gets accepted into a school and she doesn't really understand what she's going to be studying in that school. And the way that she got accepted into that school was really strange and abusive. And one of the themes that I enjoyed most in this book was a question of how we can get somebody to learn something who 
doesn't currently understand that thing or why it's important. But there is so much in this book. I need to reread it to even remember what happened because it's so philosophical. Next and translated from Chinese, this book is all the rage on booktube right now and it is The Strange Beasts of China, written by Yan Ge and translated by Jeremy Tiong. This was originally published in 2006 but only translated to English last year. This is kind of a magical realism or fantasy story. It's kind of a framed narrative because the main character is a failed zoologist who couldn't help but see beasts as people and has become a novelist instead to tell stories about the strange beasts of China, and they are usually romances. Each chapter of this book exists as sort of its own short story, all collected under this framing device of the zoologist turned novelist. And the strange beasts become increasingly intertwined in her life. Other characters include her ex-professor, his new student, and a few of her other family members and friends. This book is very imaginative. It's a reflection on what it means to be human and what it means to love and be loved. High recommendation for this one. I didn't want it to end. I listened to it as an audiobook and I could have listened to these little like anthropological definitions of strange beasts of China forever. Next and translated from Korean by the South Korean author Han Kang and translated by Deborah Smith is The Vegetarian. This is another booktube favorite. I've seen it all over the place, so I had to give it a go myself. This book is about our main character who has a dream one day and then goes vegetarian. It is written in three parts, and none of those parts are from the point of view of the main character. Rather, they are from the point of view of people close to her in her life, her husband, her sister, and her brother-in-law. The only time we hear from the main character directly is through these descriptions of her dreams, but they're very brief and they don't make a lot of sense. So the entire book is just people speculating on what is happening in the main character's head. And the book itself is not really about vegetarianism. It's more about doing things that are different from the norm and people trying to understand why you're doing it. The main character goes vegetarian, as I said, because of a dream. And everybody just wants her to have a valid reason to have gone vegetarian. Like, they just wish that she was doing it because meat grossed her out now. Or they wish she was doing it because of the climate or because of animal cruelty. But she doesn't give a reason. She says she had a dream and they cannot handle that. Eventually her actions get stranger and stranger and farther and farther away from the norm of society until it ultimately asks the question, why is it such a bad thing to want to die? So clearly this book has a lot of content warnings that you should look for before going into it. And it does not hold back in questioning the norm. So if you want to read this book, prepare to be challenged, but also entertained because it was a really good Read. We are down to the final book. Last, but definitely not least, is translated from the Japanese, and that is The Memory Police, written by Yoko Agawa and translated by Steven Snyder. The main character of this book lives on an island, and on this island, things are disappearing and people are forgetting about them. And the memory police make sure that those things disappear and these people forget. And the things range drastically from something like birds to something like books, to something like perfume. Most people just forget about these things naturally. There's just sort of a gap in their memory when it comes to these objects, and then all of the objects are disappeared by being thrown in the water or burned. So there's really no way for them to remember these objects, except that some people on the island are able to remember, and these people are usually captured by the memory police. Our main character is a novelist, and her editor turns out to be one of these people that can remember. Her and her friend, the old man, create a hiding place for their friend who edits her books. But as more and more things disappear, it gets harder and harder to keep his whereabouts a secret. This book seems to be marketed as a sci-fi, but I didn't really feel that way. It felt more like magical realism or dystopian to me. This was a delightful book, but be prepared to suspend your disbelief if you're going into this one. I don't really recommend it for people who are hardcore sci-fi lovers because there are sometimes details that don't make sense or conflict, so you can't think 
too hard about the like disappearing of things. And I liked that book enough that I picked up the short story collection by Yoko Ogawa called Revenge. And this one is also translated by Steven Snyder. So those are all my recommendations for you. Those are all of the books that I have read by women that have been translated from a language other than English. But I do plan on reading many more in the future because these are some of my favorite books of all time. If you have any recommendations for this particular niche within literature, then please let me know below because I'm desperate for them, especially if they are sci-fi. Probably the best YouTube channel to follow to get recommendations for translated fiction and translated fiction by women in particular is Books and Bao. And I actually have Vagabonds, which is a Chinese sci-fi novel on my shelf waiting to be read, which was a recommendation from Books and Bao. So check out their channel if you get a chance as well, and I'll see you in another video soon.